Oops, I'm just gonna. Okay, so it is uh, my pleasure to introduce the last speaker for uh, today's session. Uh, it's Pema Neskandari, who will speak to us about mixed motives whose motivic Galois group has a large unipotent radical. Thank you, Pema. Uh, thank you, Sundar. Uh, so uh, first thing, I want to thank the, the organizers, uh, Steve, uh, for asking me to speak here. And uh, well, I, I want to thank them doubly because as you can tell from the title of my talk, it's not exactly, you know, uh, within the theme of this, uh, this conference, but I hope that you still, you know, find it interesting. And actually, I want to uh, thank uh, Steve uh, Tripley <laughs> because <laughs> because uh, I was explaining to him uh, this work that we had done with uh, Kumar. So I was talking to him in the fall and as I was explaining to him this work that we had done with Kumar about extension classes uh, and subgroups of uh, what the, the unipotent radical. And Steve asked the question that, you know, can you do something, you know, uh, about, you know can, you, can you give an application about, you know, objects that have, you know, large unipotent radicals? Can you say something about that? And, so in a way, this whole talk, you know, owes itself to that question. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I'm gonna uh, start the talk now. So uh, this is joined with uh, Kumar, uh, who's also here. So let me start with some uh, introduction and uh, background. Uh, so uh, let's talk about Grodin's uh, period conjecture uh, for a few minutes. So suppose X is a, a smooth projective variety over uh, an algebraic subfield of C. Uh, so, you know, uh, so you have different cohomology theories attached to X. In particular, you have the singular cohomology uh, or homology attached to the uh, you know, analytic space associated to X. So you just you know, classical topology, and this is the singular homology. And then you have the algebraic theorem cohomology, and then you have the, the period pairing. Uh, between the two, which is just integration. So you take an algebraic cycle and then you integrate it over an algebraic differential form. And the numbers that arise this way, you call them uh, the periods of Hn of x. Now, uh, periods conjecture, the rough version of it, which sort of just gives the sort of a, a, a kind of like the, the intuition behind the conjecture is that uh, you know, any period relation, so any relation between these numbers that you would get, uh, Grodendieck uh, conjecture that they should come from geometry. So basically, you know, uh, geometry will re give rise to relations, you know, algebraic cycles, things like that will give rise to relations and Grodendieck's uh, conjecture is that, you know, all relations should come from geometry. So let's try to make this a little bit more precise. So now, you know, we're moving towards a precise version of this conjecture. So suppose M is a motive over, again, an algebraic subfield of C. And the way I'm going to think about motive here is very intuitively. So, uh, you know, there are pre very precise, you know, great, uh, categories uh, nowadays. We've got, you know, Nori or Ayub's category of mixed motives. So, you know, uh, categories are no, no, no longer conjectural. But, you know, for the purpose of this talk, you can think about it in terms of realizations if you want. So attached to this motive, uh, there's various realizations. You've got Betty realization, which would, you know, be a singular cohomology if you know if, you, if this is if you if your motive is cohomology of a variety you have the Deram realization and so on and so forth and uh, your sing your Betsy realization is going to be a rational vector space the Ram realization is going to be a, Q, a vector space over k k being you know uh, the same k and then you've got other realizations too which you know they're not they're not going to appear in the stock now the period realization, the, the period pairing is going to be between uh, the Deram realization and the dual of the Betty realization. So just like before, just generalizes the previous picture. So you've got this pairing between these two, uh, generalizing the previous pairing integration, and uh, so that's one side of the picture. You've got the uh, your, your period pairing, and then you can talk about periods of M, just like before. And then the other side of it, so the side of that that is geometric. So that now becomes a more abstract. So uh, through Tanakian formalism, you associate to M an algebraic group, which uh, is usually called the motivic Galois group of M. This is an algebraic group over Q, and you can naturally uh, think of it as a subgroup, as an algebraic subgroup of GL of the Betty realization. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of how this is defined, but I'm just going to say a few words about you know, uh, what characterizes it. So uh, 
this group, so, so this is the subcategory generated by M in the category of motive. So, you know, uh, you just, uh, it's a subcategory that contains M and it's closed under uh, direct sums, uh, tensor products, uh, uh, duals, uh, uh, sub quotients, uh, and sub objects. Now, any, any object of this category, so if I take any X in this category generated by M, I'll look at the Betty realization of that, this group is gonna act that, on that. So each of these Betty realizations are going to be naturally a representation of this motivic Galois group of M. And then uh, the maps that you would get, so if I have a morphism between motives, I'm gonna get morphisms between the Betty realizations and these maps are gonna be compatible with the action of this group. So in other words, the, the Betty uh, realization is going to factor through a functor, uh, factor through a functor from the category to the category of representations of this group. And most importantly, uh, this functor is now an equivalence of categories. So the category generated by M is uh, you know, by this uh, functor equivalent to the category of representations of the motivic Galois group of them. Now, sorry, can, can, I ask, can I ask a question before you move on? Yeah, of course. Oh, sorry, uh, it was the organizer trying to... Um, no, I was just going to call attention to the question in the chat, but you can go ahead. Yeah, because I, I think it has to be addressed, before, otherwise I'm going to be completely lost. So, so what kind of motives are you considering here? Because like when you These talk- These are about, classical motives, mixed classical motives. So is it gross and deep motives or, no, or- No, yeah, so I mean, if you, want, if you want to think about it in terms of a precise category, think about it as you know, the category of Nori or IU. So, so is this category independent of the realization, like the reference cohomology you're choosing? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So it's in the background because, category, back, background. Yeah. And then you have realization functors. Because because when you define this motivic Galois group, you're choosing the Betty realization. Uh, but... Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So the category is independent, but yes, for the motivic Galois group, uh, I am choosing the fiber functor, namely the Betty realization. But but is it equivalent to like the Durand realize like? Is it well, they will be. I mean, they, I mean if, if you take two different fiber, so this is like the Tanakan formalism and stuff, right? So if you take two different fiber functors, after a base change, they will be isomorphic to each other. Not, not canonically, okay? But they will always be isomorphic. So the groups that you would get, non-canonically are going to be isomorphic to each other after a base change, after a finite base change. Okay, so you do, so, okay, it does depend on what cohomology you're choosing. So from now on, you're fixing the Betty realization. Sorry, you mean the group? Yes, the, the, group. the group. Yes, the group, the fiber functor is the Betsy realization. Okay, and that's what you're going to fix from now on, right? Like you're just. Yeah, exactly. So for the group, I'm taking the Betsy realization. But the category, of course, I mean, it's got like various fiber functors, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. In terms of this period conjecture, you're also fixing the Betty realization or. Well, period conjecture is about the Betty realization and the Ram realizations, right? So it's, it's about. The so you actually have two motivic Galois groups involved, right? If you're doing two different realizations. Well, uh, yeah, well, yeah, but I mean, often, you know, the, the Betsy one, you would call it because it's an one over Q actually. The other one is only defined over K, but then after base change, they will be isomorphic to each other and the period conjecture, uh, I'm getting a little bit of myself, but what I'm statement that I'm gonna, you know, uh, you know give in a, in a, in a minute, it will, is equivalent to saying that, you know, so you get an isomorphism between those two groups, there's like a torsor, and the comparison isomorphism would be a, a complex point of that. And the period conjecture is saying that that's a generic one. So, so technically speaking, can you take the Durang motivated Gawa group and then take transcendence degree over K? Sure, yeah, yeah they would be the same. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah, for sure, yeah. no problem. Okay, so, uh, and then the precise uh, version of the period conjecture is that the transcendence degree of the, of the field generated by the periods of M is equal to the dimension of the motivic Galois group of M. So a few remarks here. One thing is that note that K here is algebraic. Okay, so that's crucial to have uh, you know, for in this conjecture, that's crucial. If you drop that condition, then you would only you know, expect an inequality. Now, the other remark is that actually uh, one so the fact that the transcendence degree is at most the dimension of the Galois group, that's actually very easy to prove. So by the machinery that is there is very easy to prove. The proof is basically already in, 
uh, Berlin's, uh, you know, uh, paper in the 80s uh, on absolute Hodge cycles and abelian varieties, and might have been even known before then. But, but so th th this, this in the fact that you, uh, the transcendence degree is at most this, that's, that's you know, quite well known. Uh, and that reflects the fact that, you know, geometry does give you relations, but the question is, do you get all relations? So does every relation come from geometry? And that's exactly the fact that, you know, you have a, the, the, the open inequality, the inequality that is open. So the, the, that's to say that the transcendence degree is at least equal to the dimension of the material gap. That's one remark. The other remark that I want to make, because you know, there's there's quite a bit of jump. I mean, there's, there's actually, you know, yeah, there's, there's a considerable amount of jump. Jump, and you go from this version to this version. So one may think that you know uh, this formalism, this you know this formulation has been done later on, and you know attributed to Grolenli, but that's actually not the case. So even though you know none of the in the categories were all you know conjectural and. None of these objects really existed at the time of Grodenli, but actually, essentially, this formulation is is a does exist in Grodenli's own notes. So I, I refer you to uh, Andre's letter uh, in a, to to uh, Christiana Bertolini in a recent paper of her 2020 paper of her. There's a really beautiful letter where she where uh, Andre talks about you know the sort of like history of uh, the period Grodenli's period conjecture and. Sort of, you know, puts it into context, and he discusses this that you know this actually is really due to Grodin, even this formulation. Okay, so that's the that's about the period conjecture. So let me look at some examples now. Uh, first example, uh, let's look at let's take M to be the um, H two of P one. So that's a, that's a, that's one dimension now, and uh, it has weight two. So you know that by Q minus one. It's the left Schutz motor. The same as H1 of GN. And uh, okay, the period of this is, I mean, this is, you know, uh, first course in complex analysis. We, uh, our students can calculate this period essentially. So, uh, basis for the RAM cohomology would be DZ, DZ over Z. And then uh, this would be the generator of the psych, of the of homology. So, 2 pi i would be the period. And then the motivic Galois group, okay, so remember the motivic Galois group embeds into GL of the Betty realization. So Betty realization here is one dimensional. So it will be a subgroup of GM and it's non-trivial because that guy is not the unit object. So it follows that, you know, this, has, this is actually isomorphic to GM. So in this case, what you would get is that, uh, so what does Grolenik's conjecture predict here? It says that, okay, so the transcendence degree of field, you know, uh, so two pi i, Transcendence of Q adjoint two pi i should be equal to the dimension of this, which is one. So in other words, pi should be transcendent, which we know it. So in this case, the period conjecture is not. It amounts to the transcendence of pi. Another example, let's look at, a, look at H1 of an elliptic curve. I'm taking it over Q bar. So in this case, okay, so the motivic Galois group, again, it's a, so now it's, this is contained in the GL of H1 of the curve but that's two dimensional. So it's contained in GL2. Now, uh, by, you know, since uh, this, the motivic Galois group is supposed to, res it respects all morphisms in the category. So because of that, it's, uh, you know, one can uh, it's easily argue, uh, it's, it's a fairly short argument to see that uh, your motivic Galois group, uh, there's two cases here. E if E has CM, then the motivic Galois group is gonna be a two dimensional torus. And if it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't have complex multiplication, then actually it has to be all of GL2. So in this case, uh, the motivic Galois group is either two-dimensional or four-dimensional, depending on whether E uh, ha does or does not have CM. So now, so what does the, uh, the period conjecture predict now? That the transcendence degree of the field generated by the periods is equal to either two or four, depending on whether or not you have CM. Now, in this case, so you have this theorem of Chodnovsky that the transcendence degree of the, the, of the periods of an elliptic curve is at least two. You have an elliptic curve defined over Q bar. This is at least two. And so because of Chodnovsky's theorem, the, in the CM case, uh, you, you, you get the period conjecture. In the non-CM case, the period conjecture is over. So these 
two examples were uh, examples of pure motives, but now I want to move to mixed examples. Uh, uh, and the talk is really about mixed you know, motives. So uh, these examples are, are more uh, relevant to the talk. So let's get some mixed examples. So if you look at X1 uh, extensions of one by QN, so QN is Q1 tensors by itself n times. Now here I put uh, as the category, I put mixed state motives over Q because I, I don't want this discussion to be conjectural. So in the category of mixed state motives over Q uh, constructed by Borowski, this is actually a theorem that the X groups are given by these things. So Borowski proves that these are related to, you know, it follows from this construction that these are related to K theory and then uh, K groups, uh, relevant K groups are calculated by Borel, whole theorem of Borel. So in this case, ex extension of one by QN are as follows. Uh, so if N is negative, so that's to say that if the weight is actually positive, if the way, if, if, uh, if N is less than or equal to zero, and that was weight is bigger than or equal to zero, or N is even, there's no non-trivial extension. If n is odd and at least three, then this is one dimensional. And then if n is one, so extensions are one by q1, that's uh, isomorphic to q star tensors with q. Now, okay, so now let's look at some examples. So I wanna look at one example in this case and another example in this case. So first example, that let's take n to be odd and greater than or equal to three. So in this case, we know that you know, the, 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 the X group extensions are one by QN, that's one dimensional. And in fact, so, okay, so, so essentially, uh, you know, uh, the, well, if you look at the object that is actually an extension of QN by one, up to isomorphism, that object will be unique. Uh, and then thanks to uh, the lean, one knows that the period matrix of this M extension, not trivial extension of one by QN, the period matrix is given by this. So uh, zeta N is a period of F. So zeta N is a non-trivial, is a period of the non-trivial extension of one by QN. And then, so this is, this would be the period matrix. So you have two pi into the power of minus N that comes from this guy, and then there's zeta N and so on. So now, okay, so that's the period matrix. But now let's think about the motivic Galois group. Now the motivic Galois group, and this diagram is actually quite general and it's gonna appear you know, in a few slides again in, 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 more, in, in more general context. So the motivic, so the, you know, if you look at the, by restricting the action of the motivic Galois group of M to uh, the subgroup generated by the associated graded of M. So this is the associated graded with respect to the weight equation. By restricting that action, you get a, a, you get a surjective more homomorphism from the motivic Galois group of M to the motivic Galois group of the associated graded. And then the kernel of that, I'm gonna call it by a motivic U. And uh, now this is, a, this is actually, so this, this one is a reductive and this one is actually unipotent and, and sort of see why, because see the point is that this one here, okay, so remember we said that the uh, motivic Galois group is supposed to respect morphisms. So uh, in particular, it's gonna respect the weight filtration. So this is going to be contained in the subgroup of a, GLNB that you know uh, respects the weight filtration, that parabolic subgroup. And then this guy here, again, you know, by the same token, because that's to respect morphisms and, and so on and so forth. So this will be actually contained in the product of the of GL of the associated gradients. And then this would be restriction map and the kernel of this. So if there would be the, you know, if I write things like a matrix, you know, I change my basis correctly, so on and so forth. So this would be upper triangular matrices and uh, upper triangular uh, invertible matrices. And then this would be projecting the two diagonal uh, entities. And then uh, the, the kernel would be set of these matrices, which is unipotent and this is contained in here. Sorry, can I ask why, why is this motivated Galois group uh, reductive? Of this great graded part, the graded part, yeah, because so uh, so the the objects get generated uh, by the by the by uh, the the direct sum of pure objects are semi simple, and that's because of polarization. Polarization, ah, yeah. You have a polarization, so you're. Cons uh, I mean, you don't have a polarization. These are motives. These are not just abstract Hodge structures. Okay. Okay. Thanks. No problem. 
So, uh, so now this, this motivic U would be, okay, so it's contained in here. So, uh, so this is isomorphic to G, the additive uh, GA. So this is either zero or GA. But now, okay, so uh, because this, uh, because M is a non-trivial extension, so the subcategory generated by M is not a semi-simple category. So this guy can't be zero because otherwise this would be just the same as this. and would be the category of semi-simple. So it has to be GA in this case. But then the, when you look at the dimension of the motivic Galois group, so that's the dimension of, the, of this guy plus the dimension of this, uh, this guy. And now, well, this is just GM and this is, uh, this is GA. So it's two. And so pre uh, period conjecture predicts that, okay, so that, that's the period matrix. So it predicts that two pi i and zeta of n are algebraically independent over Q. That's what the period conjecture predicts in this case, which is of course an open, you know, open question. But that is the prediction of the, uh, the period conjecture. Another example. So now I want to look at non-trivial extensions of one by Q one. So these are uh, remember we said that x one uh, extension of one by Q one that's Q star tends to Q. But to be more explicit, these would be these are given by uh, so so called Kummer uh, motifs. So take M to be a uh, so I'm using the, you know, this is the this is the one motive, you know, in the sense of the, the lean. So you take the one motive, uh, Z going to GM, mapping to GM, the map being sending one to R, R being a rational number greater than one. Okay, so this is a this is a this is the lean's one motive. You can think about it also as an object in Wolbowski's category uh, category. So now uh, because we took R to be bigger than one, it's not torsion. This would be a non-trivial extension of one by Q one. And the period matrix of this is a, well, okay, so there's a two pi i to power minus one because of that. The interesting thing is that now you get a log r here. So log r divided by two pi i is gonna be another period. And essentially this is because, so this guy here, this motive, you can think of it as H1 of a GM with the points one and r identified with each other. So now here, you know, this gamma, this, this would be a cycle there. So you're integrating one over z over this gamma, which gives you a one over r. No, sorry, gives you log r. So that's where that occurs. But the, so this would be the period uh, matrix of, uh, of this one motive. And now by the exact same argument as before, I mean, all we needed in this argument was that, you know, these, these are both one dimensional and this was not trivial extension. By the exact same argument, the motivic Galois group of M is again two dimensional. So this time the period conjecture predicts that two pi i and log r are algebraically independent over Q. Okay, any questions about any of these two examples? Uh, Okay, so these examples are gonna appear again, uh, but now let's uh, you know, uh, talk about something general. So we're gonna talk about the unipotent radical of the motivic Galois group. So the same extension, the same you know, diagram that we had a couple of slides ago, I've re rewritten it here, that was quite general. So the restriction map from the motivic Galois group of M to the motivic Galois group with the associated graded, and then the kernel, we call it uh, motivic U and then uh, U mod, and then this is contained, the exact same diagram. And then this would be now, you know, if you write things as a, you know, as an intricacy, this would be now upper triangular unipotent matrices like that. This is unipotent, uh, and this would be the unipotent radical of this group. Now, this unipotent radical, so if you think about, think about it's Lie algebra. So you have, to, you have the adjoint representation of this group. That's a normal subgroup, so it acts on the Lie algebra of, uh, of the subgroup uh, on this guy. And then remember that uh, that, that Tanakin formalism, that equivalence of categories that we had, that there's, so a representation of this is the same as an object uh, in, the, in, 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 the, in, your, in the category. So via Tanakin formalism, you actually get a, yeah, so you actually get an object which I'm going to note it by underlined you, you mode who's, uh, who's, uh, you know, who's, who's Betsy realization is this you mode. But now see this you mode, this Lie algebra is contained in the Lie algebra of this group. And the Lie algebra of this group is easily seen to be uh, those endomorphisms of MB 
but this is just you know this is this is just a calculation in the algebra groups. But the algebra is endomorphisms of N B, which drop the weight filtration by one. So for every n, uh, they send W n to W n minus one. No, 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 denote that by W minus one and M. This, this, this the algebra of this is contained in here. And then it's easy to see that actually, if you look at the actions, you know, uh, so on and so forth, you, you see that actually the, this motivic, uh, the, this motive that you get. So this is the sort of motivically algebra of the unipotent radical. This would be actually a sub object of W minus one on, of a internal end. Of M. So this is the internal harm object, inner harm M comma M. And this would be actually a sub object of that. So in other words, th this inclusion you know, comes from actually an inclusion in the category of motives. So now, so the point is that the conclusion of this uh, slide is that you know, the, the uh, unipotent motor, uh, this, this U mode, uh, this Lie algebra, is actually a sub motive of W minus 1 and M. Now, we make the following definition that we're going to say our motive has a large unipotent radical if the if the if the, if the uh, motivic uh, u is actually all of w minus one and m. So it actually fills up that entire uh, w minus one and m. It's as large as it can be. Now let's look at uh, an example here. I want to look at an example with two weights. So suppose you've got a simple object L, which has negative weight, and suppose you have an extension like this. So L uh, M is an extension of one by L. So some L is simple of negative weight. So uh, M would be of two weights, zero, and then uh, whatever the weight of L is, the associate weight of M would be one plus L. Now. If, so what is W minus one and N? You can easily see that this is actually just harm one L. And now, well, this is, this is the same as L. So now we assume that L is simple. So there's, there aren't too many options because the, 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 you, uh, you know, the motivic U, U, UM, I'm, gonna, I'm just calling it UM if you don't mind from now, from now on instead of keeping, you know, keep calling it motivic U. So UM is a sub object of L. And this is simple, so there aren't too many options, either zero or L, but, and that would depend on whether M is semi-simple or not. If M is semi-simple, then uh, by the diagram that we had, uh, this guy has to be zero. On the other hand, uh, if M is uh, not semi-simple, then L can't be zero by the same token, and so L, so uh, U has to be all of L action. So in this case, the determination of, the, uh, of UM is very easy. It only depends on whether this extension is squared or not. Now, more complicated case would be let's just, let's drop this condition of uh, simplicity. So let's keep our L pure of some negative weight, but let's no longer assume that it's simple. So we now you know, direct some of simple objects, and then this is a, this is a due to, uh, to uh, so uh, th thanks to the work of Bertrand and and Hardon, one knows. That in this case, well, in this case, one again has a very nice description of the, you know, uh, thanks to the work, has a very nice description of this um, motivic U. And it will be large if and only if this extension here is totally non split, by which I mean that if I look at push forwards of this along, you know, uh, along sub quotients of L. None of the, uh, as long as you don't mod out by all of L, the extension won't split. Right? So if I mod out, if I, if, I, if I push forward this to a non trivial uh, sub quotient of L, the extension doesn't split. That's what I mean by totally non split. Uh, Pavan, on the, hmm. the line with the star, you mean L is pure of negative weight, right? I guess. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That is definitely. Yeah. Thanks, Kumar. So, uh, so that takes care of the case where you have uh, two weights. Now, it's easy to see that if M has a large unipotent radical, then for every P, for every integer P, and my apologies because maybe I should have apologized before too. Did I use P before? No, so I didn't. So this is the first time I'm using uh, WP. So I apologize because uh, P is not a prime yet, but that's okay. So uh, if, it's easy to see that, so P is any integer here. It's easy to see that if M has a large unipotent radical, then for any P, 
both WPN and M mod WPN will have large unipotent radicals. And to sort of just, you know, to convince you that this is true, see, the point is that if you're thinking about matrices, you know, the restriction maps that you have, you know, like from, you know, group of M to the groups of, you know, say other, other objects in the same category, they would be always sort of in the category generated by M, they would be surjected. And then it was that surjection also holds for the unipotent radicals. And so essentially what's happening here is that, you know, for M to have a large unipotent radical, you're saying that, you know, if you look at the unipotent radical, this entire space is being filled up. And then when I say these two, so now I'm saying that, well, so if that entire space is, you know, uh, is filled up, then this portion and this portion will be filled up as well. So that's, a, that's, that's essentially a trivial observation, yeah? But now, The converse is not true, and, and you would expect this converse not to be true in general, of course, by, you know, by the sort of intuitive uh, picture that I just drew, because there's also that top right corner, of course. So uh, it's, it's, the converse is not true, that if these two guys are large, then uh, you know, this would be, have a large unipotent radical, and you can easily, uh, right, so as a matter of fact, you can just, uh, you can, this is a, uh, right, so, yeah, so here I wrote that you can get an example using Jackie Rodriguez's uh, deficient points, but for this particular thing, actually, you don't need that. You just take the direct sum of, uh, right? I mean, if your M is just the direct sum of these two, for example, that would give you a counter example. But so the point is that the converse is not true. But now we have the following uh, result. So this is the, the result uh, joint with Kumar that gives a, a sufficient condition for the converse to actually be true. It's, uh, here, here's the statement, it says the following, that uh, suppose P is negative and suppose the associated graded of M is one plus uh, GER PM plus lower rate pieces and GER PM is not zero. So in other words, you're assuming that, you know, the two highest, the highest rates of M is zero and the, and the rate zero part in the associated graded is one, the unit object. The next highest weight is P, and it's genuinely the next highest weight in the sense that GER PM is actually non-zero. And then after that, you know, so weights below that, whatever wants to happen, that, that's a good one. So P is the second highest weight. Now suppose that both WPM and M mod WP minus one have large unipotent radicals. I changed this, so this is no longer M mod WP, it's M mod WP minus one have large unipotent radicals. And suppose moreover that the associated graded of M satisfies what we, what we call an independence axiom. And I'm gonna uh, say a few words about this in a second. Then M will have a large unipotent radical. So largeness of these two guys together with the independence axiom implies that M has a large unipotent radical itself. And before I tell you more about the independence axiom, one remark that I want to make is that the second condition is actually crucial. So if you only have the first condition, the statement, the conclusion will not necessarily be true. And that's where this Jack, you know, Ribet deficient points come into the picture. That would be a counterexample for this theorem, uh, you know, with the, with the second condition being removed. Yeah. But now this independence axiom business. So the, the actual condition is, is, is a bit technical. So I'm not gonna give the, the precise condition here, but what I'm gonna say is that in particular, this independence axiom is satisfied if you have the following. If, see, if, if you think about W minus one of N of N, the weights of that would be the differences between the weights of M. The pairwise differences between the weights of M, then not, you know, and you're just only taking the negative uh, differences. Now, in principle, you know, these differences may coincide. But now suppose that the, the, the weights of W minus one, actually the number of them is just the number of weights of M. So uh, yeah, the number of weights of M choose two. So in other words, when you look at the, you know, the, the differences between different weights, there is no coincidences. So, Right? So uh, in that case, the independence axiom will actually be satisfied. So for example, suppose your M has weights minus three, minus one and zero. So now I'm looking at differences, minus one, minus two, minus three, all different, we're good. So the independence axiom will be satisfied in this case. In general, it's about some, some, some 
it's about two sub objects of W minus one and GUR M associated with graded of M, two sub object of that to be independent in the sense that they have no non-zero uh, isomorphic sub objects. Okay, so now what, what I wanna do is that I wanna give an application of this uh, for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. And then in the end, uh, if there's time, I'm gonna come back and you know, uh, be able to you know, give some indications on what goes into this theorem. So now the application is to constructing motives with large, large unipotent radicals. So what do we wanna do? We wanna inductively construct larger and larger motives with large unipotent radicals. So uh, see, the point is that with two weights, this is fairly easy to do, uh, but then you, you somehow wanna you know, patch together, you know, maybe two two weights, get a, get, get a larger motive still with a large, uh, large unipotent radical and so on and so forth. So let's see, suppose that, you know, our, our, you have a motive M, which, you know, uh, li like in the theorem, you know, it's, a, it's, it's highest weight uh, piece is one, it's been associated graded, and then after that, there's a good P, P minus one, non-zero, and then you know, a bunch of other stuff, lower weight. Now, such an M is gonna give rise to a diagram like this. So uh, the, the, this, this uh, column here, so, so rows and columns are exact here. This one is just the inclusion of WPM into M. And you know that, that quotient is one by, by that condition. So that's that. And then here we have a inclusion of WP minus one into WP, and that's gonna give us this GER P, yeah. And then, uh, and then on, on this, and, and then this, uh, on here we have WP minus one into M, M mod WP minus one. And then here you have a, so if you start from here and mod everything out by WP minus one. So you get GER P to w, M mod W P minus one to one. So that's what this column is. So any uh, M, you know, uh, like that is gonna give us a diagram like this. And now what we wanna do is that we wanna say that, okay, suppose I, I, I know this guy. So suppose you give me this and this, and you're not giving me an M, because you're just giving me an object, eh, this guy here, and you know, this row essentially, and you give me this column, yeah? And I wanna know that, uh, well, can I complete the diagram to such a diagram? So given WP and M mod WP minus one, can we patch them together to form an M? Because if we can do this, then you know, using the previous result, we can try to construct larger and larger motors with important larger important radicals. This guy and this guy should have, we want we would want them to have larger important radicals. And then if we make sure that our uh, you know, independence axiom holds, then the M that we would get will also have a larger important radical. So now this, this problem here, you know, patching together this guy and this guy, this is actually something that the uh, Groden Lee considered uh, in SGA7. Uh, so this is it's his formalism of uh, extension uh, panache uh, or blended extensions. Bertrand uh, translates this as blended extensions. So you, you're given an object. Uh, so this, 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 this little bit, happen, you know, is, is valid in, in any abelian category. So you're given objects, a, B, C, so A, B, C, and then you're given an extension of A by B, the horizontal row, and then an extension of C by A, the vertical, uh, the horizontal sequence and the vertical sequence. So I'm gonna, you know, in this notation, I'm gonna stick to this notation. So by L, I would mean this, you know, uh, my, my horizontal one, and by N, I would mean my vertical one. So you're given such a thing, and you wanna know you want to know when you can complete your diagram to a diagram, you know, as we had before, a diagram like this. So we're going to say that, you know, our uh, pair of extensions L comma N is compatible if there's an object M which fits into a diagram like this. And then we're going to say that the object M is attached to the pair. Such an object is attached to the pair. So now, Grothendieck tells us that a, a pair of extensions L comma N is compatible if and only if the Yoneda uh, composition L O N in X two of C comma B vanishes. 
So let's see, you know, uh, what that what that is saying. See, this is L, an extension of A by B, and this is N, an extension of C by A. And now compose these two arrows. You're gonna get this arrow here from L to N. And now look at this highlighted uh, sequence, and that, that's gonna give you an element. It's, it's exact. It's gonna give you something in X two of C comma B. That's this composition. This unit of composition and. Uh, the pair is compatible if and only if this element of X2 vanishes. Also, if it happens that X1 C comma B is zero, then M is unique up to isomorphism. So the compatibility criterion amounts to vanishing of uh, something in X2. And then uh, if, if X1 C comma B is zero, then you get actually something unique. And the proof of this is actually, I mean, it, it just follows from uh, Yoneda's formalism of, uh, of, of you know, Yoneda extensions. If you look at the long exact sequence, then you get, you get both of these things. Okay, so now that we have this, let's look at some examples. We are equipped to be able to give uh, our examples. So what we want to do is I want to construct some examples of three-dimensional mixed state motifs. So I'm going to stick to the category of mixed state motifs because there we actually know the X groups. So we're going to give some examples of mixed state motifs uh, over Q. Uh, this is over Q. Uh, with large unipotent radical, three-dimensional, uh, with uh, three different weights. The highest weight, we can, we, can, we can just take it to be one without loss generality. So associated the greater with Qn plus Qk plus Q1. And I'm going to assume n is bigger than k, so n bigger than zero. And so we, we're going to... So remember we had that independence axiom, that independence axiom here would amount to the condition that N is not 2K because you want the difference of weights to be all different. So this one would be a 2K, this one would be a 2N minus 2K and you want these to be different. So that's to say that you don't want N to be 2K. So I'm gonna you know, include that condition there. And let's recall the relevant X groups here, X, X1 of 1QN. So uh, you know if, uh, if n is even, this would be zero. If n is odd and greater or equal to three, it would be one dimensional. And then if n is one, this would be the Kummer motives that we talked about, motives of you know, log r's. And then the X2 groups vanish in mixed state motives over Q. Again, you know, uh, due to uh, Vorwalski's construction. So we know that, so in, in general, of course, in the category of mixed state motives over a number, field, number field one expects the X2 groups to vanish, higher X groups to all vanish. But for mixed state motives, this is actually known. For mixed state motives over Q, this is actually known. So that's the, that we have that. So the compatibility, you know, restriction is guaranteed. You don't have to worry about it here. You can always patch together your extensions. Now, because see, we're trying to construct motors with large unipotent radicals. So we want our L, the horizontal extent uh, sequence and the vertical one, the N to be, uh, be non-trivial. So I would need the extension of, so the, uh, the vertical one is an extension of one by QK. The horizontal one is an extension of QK by QN. To have non-trivial such extensions, I would need K to be odd from here and I would need N minus K to also be to be odd. So K has to be odd and N has to be even. So let's look at some, let's look at what happens here. So first case, so again, N is even. Now I'm gonna take my K to be one and N is bigger than two because we don't, I mean, to, that's to satisfy, you know, satisfy the independence axiom and N is even. So now for the horizontal uh, arrow, you're gonna take a non-trivial extension of, you want a non-trivial extension of Q1 by QN. Well, that's you know, uh, isomorphic to extensions of one by QN minus one. That's one dimensional, uh, you know, motive of zeta and minus one, if you want to call it, would be a generator. So that, that the period, uh, and, but, but we're twisting it by, uh, by Q1. So I'm going to take, you know, uh, L to be a, a generator of this. Uh, and the period matrix of that, because of the twist by Q1, you know, it's, it's a period of, zeta in a motive of zeta and minus one, but you have to multiply with a two pi i to the power of minus one. So this would be the period matrix with zeta two minus one, zeta of n minus one here. And then for the vertical arrow, I'm gonna, so vertical arrow is supposed to be an extension of one by Q1. So these are now the Kummer motives. So we're gonna take you know, the, the, the motive of log r, the one that has log r as a period. There's no, uh, yeah, so the one that has two pi i minus one log r as a period. So that's the vertical uh, extension now, and then you, you know, play the extension of Panache uh, 
in formalism game and then so you get an you get an m you know an m exists but even better than that because see if you look at this uh, x1 c comma v this condition is now satisfied actually because you'll be looking at extensions of one by qn and n is even so that's zero so you actually get a unique object attached to this uh, these two pairs of extensions pair of extensions so you get a unique object i'm going to denote it by m n comma r mixed in mixed state models over q which completes the diagram and it has a large unipotent radical because well the l and n you know uh, are uh, you know those are non-split and you know, you're in the situation where non-split actually means they, these objects having a large unipotent radical. So the L and N you know, have a large unipotent radical and your independence axiom is satisfied because of the weights you know, being nicely distributed. And so uh, the previous theorem will tell you that uh, this motive actually has a large unipotent radical. But now, so the, the dimension of the motivic Galois group would be the dimension of the unipotent radical plus the dimension of motivic Galois group of Q1. That's, that's a one, that's a GM, that's one dimension is one. But this one here, well, it's, it's the motive is three dimensional and W minus one and then with the, and it's got three different weights. W minus one and then is three choose two dimensional, three dimensional and by largeness. So that is, that is you know, the dimension of this unipotent uh, uh, motivic U. So this dimension will be four. So now look at the matrix, think about the matrix of periods of this object. Okay, so now here is the matrix of the period of uh, periods of the motive of zeta minus one twisted. And then here you have a you know, matrix for N. So with respect to suitably chosen, uh, chosen bases, your matrix of periods will look like this. There's zeta and uh, there's, there's a bunch of two pi there's zeta and minus one, there's a log R and there's some entry up there. And the period conjecture says that the transcendence degree of uh, Q adjoint these numbers uh, should be four, over Q should be four. So that is to say the numbers two pi i, zeta and minus one, log r and star, enter the star, have to be algebraically independent over Q. That's what the period conjecture predicts. But now, okay, so then what is star? And the answer is we don't know. And we would like to you know, think about this, uh, you know, soon hopefully and one one remark that i want to make about this star is that see so there's this brown work brown's work on uh, periods of mixed state category of mixed state motives over z and those are generated by two pi and multiple zeta values but this doesn't live in that uh, in that world because because of the kumar motive that you included in the construction so these these guys are not mixed mixed motives over z so this is most likely you've left, uh, you know, uh, multiple zeta values and you're getting something else there. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's an interesting question. And uh, so next example, any question about this example? So next example, the weights are now, okay, so now I'm taking them, you know, now I'm going to take K to be, maybe, maybe before I do this example, I'm going to go, I'm going to talk about this case now. See, the previous case was when you had Qn, Q1, and 1. Now, the dual case after that would be when you have Qn, Qn minus 1, and 1. Again, n bigger than equal to 2 and even. This, this story is very similar to the discussion that we just had. Again, you know, now this time for this portion, you're going to have to take a, a, you know, a, a, a motive of zeta value. Then for this portion, you're going to take a log and then you patch them together. You can you'll patch them together uniquely and you're going to get these objects that are uh, like that. And then, and then you know, uh, there's, it's easy. I mean, by the uniqueness properties, basically it's easy to see that the motives you get up to a shift are actually duals of the motives that you get in the, previous, in the, in the first case. So you're not getting anything new here, essentially. But this case here now, so this is the, the third, you know, the remaining case where your K is not one or N minus one. Now in this case, for both horizontal vertical uh, uh, sequences, uh, you're gonna get, you, you'll have to take a, a more you know, extensions that come from uh, zeta values, odd zeta values. And then so, uh, you know, they're, they're, so, and, and then when you patch them together, what you're gonna get is a, is a Z, this would be, so you will only get one object here, for, uh, you know, uh, with that associated gradient and large unipotent radical and the period matrix will look like this. There's a zeta K from here. And then there's a, there's a zeta N minus K from there. 
because this is the this is the you take extension of one by q n minus k and you twisted it. So there's zeta n minus k and that, that's the twist. And then there's a new entry star there, which again, you know, together with the with two pi i zeta n minus k zeta k should be algebraically independent over q according to the period conjecture. But this example here, I want to say is less interesting than the previous example because this this motive actually is going to be a motive, uh, mixed state motive over Z because the extensions that you work with, these extensions are, are actually extensions of mixed state motives over Z. So the point is that if, you, if I look back at the X groups that we had here, the X, so X2 groups also vanish in mixed state motives over Z. The X1 groups are the same for mixed state motives over Q and over Z, except when N is one. In that case, mixed state motors over Z, the X group will be zero and mixed state motors over Q, you're gonna get uh, something infinite dimension. So, but in, in this, this case here, you know, everything is a mixed state motor over Z. So what you're gonna get here, this thing will be, you know, uh, up, you know, will be a linear combination of, uh, with Q two pi R linear combination of multiple Zeta values due to, uh, thanks to Brown's work. So uh, these are some examples. And then I also wanna give a four dimensional example. Uh, so now, you know, you can play this game, continue playing this game, but now I'm gonna take it, you know, something that you constructed before and then, you know, patch it together with, with, a, with a vertical uh, extension and then construct a four dimensional example with larger input radical. And then you can go, you know, go to higher and higher dimension, larger and low, larger motives. But the four dimensional one is interesting. So I, I do wanna actually spend a few minutes here do this. So now what we're gonna do is that for the, vert, for the horizontal uh, extension, we're gonna take, see, we're gonna start, start with the, uh, the motive M4 comma R that we just constructed. So this is associated graded as Q4 plus Q1 plus one. This portion here is zeta of three twisted by one. And then this portion here is a is motive of log r. And now what we're gonna do is that we're gonna twist this by five and I'll, I'll tell you in, in a minute why we're twisting it by five. So we twist it by five and now once it, and then you take, you're gonna take that as the horizontal thing. For the vertical one, I'm gonna take well the non-trivial extension of one by Q five. And then X2 groups vanish. So you, you, you can patch these two things together, get objects, there's objects associated to this pair. But the interesting thing here is that the X1 group that you'll be looking at, so one comma this W minus two, that's actually not, not zero, right? Because it will contain X1, one comma Q9, and that's a one dimensional thing. So this, this X group is not zero. It's actually one dimensional. So in fact, this time you're getting a family of, of objects attached to the pair, not just one object, not just one canonical object. But now each of those objects, the associated graded will look like that. So this is the associated grade of you know, M, M4 comma R, twisted by five, and then by Q5, and then uh, there's a one, new one added up to the end. And then, you know, the, and this is why we twisted it by five, it's in order to satisfy the independence axiom. See, now, because I twisted by five, the number, when I look at these consecutive differences, they will still be all different. So the independence axiom still holds. If you, if you try to twist by something less than five, the independence axiom will fail. And then, so, so you know, by, by a result, this, these objects that you will get, all of them, they will have large unipotent radicals. Now, if you look at the matrix of periods of such a thing, so this portion here now is the, let me just go this slide. This portion here is just the, it's, 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 you start with the, the matrix of a, you know, M4R and then you're just twisting it by uh, multiplying it two pi I two pi minus five, that's what this is. This portion here is, well, uh, is the is zeta of five because, well, that, this, this was the zeta of five extension. So that's why you have a, this, this guy here, and then you've got this, uh, so these three entries, star one, star two, star three. Star one is just the, what I wanna call new motive of, you know, I'm sorry, new period of M4R, well, two pi to five minus five like that. This guy here, see now the point is that if you look at this portion of this, so you're looking at now this guy here, so you're modding out M tilde by Q9, okay? If you look at this portion, well, it's gonna have a large unipotent radical, 
the weights are, I mean, those, that's the associated graded. And then by looking at, well, this portion you have a log R, and then this portion you have a zeta phi. That is what we looked at in this third example. So that, that, that other entity star two is also something, well, familiar in the sense that, well, it's unknown, but we already discussed that it's unknown, it would be the new period of this guy here, which is closely by duality related to new period of M6R. But then there's also that genuinely new period there. And now if you look at the dimension of the motivic Galois group, okay, so the yeah, motivic Galois associated graded, that's one dimensional, that's just GN, but this guy here, okay, so now the thing is four dimensional, uh, and so W minus one and uh, would be, and M would be uh, four choose two dimensional, six dimensional, your motive has large and important radical. So this is all uh, six, so this would be seven. And so what that tells us is that two pi I, zeta three, zeta five, log r, there's four, and then these three guys, all have to be algebraically independent over q. Now, what's interesting about this uh, is that, see, remember that actually you're not getting a canonical object anymore here. This is actually, a, a, it, it's a family. It's a one-dimensional family that you're getting. So th this is actually, it's, it's varying, right? It, well, potentially you would think that it should be varying. So again, hopefully we're gonna you know, think about these periods uh, soon and try to see what these are. But now I only have, okay, I have four minutes. I think that's enough for me to be able to, uh, if, I, if I rush a little bit, I can, I can tell you a little bit about what's going on behind, what, what goes behind the, the theorem that we have, that largeness criteria. So I wanna talk about the motivic uh, unipotent radical uh, and the uh, and extension classes of M. So here, let M be any motor. And in fact, this discussion is more general. You can just take any Tanakian category characteristic zero with the weight filtration, nice weight filtration, like the filtration motor, as long as we also want to assume the associated grade of M is semi-simple. Now, for any P, you have this extension, WP into M and then to the quotient. All right, so that's an extension of M mod WP by WP. Now, you know, by the canonical isomorphisms, this, this you can identify this with extensions of one by internal harm of M mod WP, WP, the usual you know, linear algebra stuff. Uh, and, then, uh, and then this guy here, uh, well, I shouldn't say linear algebra because we don't have into extensions there, but you, you know what I mean. But now, okay, so this extension there gives you an element here, and I'm gonna call that, you know, EPM. So, you know, Pth extension class of M. Now, you know, by, you know, functoriality, if you use the functoriality of both variables in harm, you, you get an injection from this internal harm to W minus one and M. And then by weight considerations, you can see that actually the, the map, the, the push forward map between the extensions will have to be injected. And so the, uh, the uh, image of this in here, I'm also gonna be noted by WP. And then let EM, so this is the total class of M to be, be the sum of all these EPs. Yeah? And then the lean, the re recent result of the lean that characterizes the UM, this, the algebra of unipotent radical in terms of this extension class. And here's the theorem. So this appears in an appendix of a, a invention paper of a, a Yosem, Peter Yosem on a, a Manfold height conjecture on one motifs. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's via private communication. Yosem reproduces the proof, but it's due to the lean. It says that you, uh, the motivic uh, Lie algebra is the smallest sub-object of this such that this extension is in the, it, it comes from you. So you know, it's, it's the smallest sub-object of this such that EM, the total extension is in the image of this push forward. And the proof of the lean, and I don't wanna, I don't want to go through this, but the proof of the lean is actually constructive. It actually constructs the extension here that pushes forward to the class of M. Now, what we have to do, and this, this, actually this was done before we, we, we did the application on large and important radicals. We looked at these individual classes EPs. So you know that EM comes from U, uh, U or from U, and it was this push forward EM by the quotient map by U is zero. But then what about these individual extensions EP? Do they also you know, uh, come from uh, you, you? And the answer is no. And you can construct an examples using Jackie Noda, but uh, deficient points on some of varieties. But then the independence axiom, this, this is where the independence axiom played a role. They are actually going to guarantee that this is zero. That's the key thing. And this is, this is absolutely key in the, in the proof of the uh, largeness criterion. The fact that 
the individual extensions EP will now come from the unipotent, the algebra of the unipotent diagram. So I think it's about four o'clock, so I, I will stop uh, here. Okay, thank you very much, Payman, for your talk. Let's uh, give him a round of applause. Are there any questions or comments for Payman? Uh, can, can I ask? So, how, how robust is your theorem, like when you change the category of motives? Oh, uh, our theorem is very robust, actually. So all you need really is a, uh, well, okay. So in the constructions, those X groups come into the picture, right? So you would wanna have the correct X groups, right? Especially when you're talking about the uniqueness. But the, 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 the largeness criterion, and then, uh, and then this result here about, you know, this thing, this is very, very general. All, all you need is a Tanakian category. Uh, equipped to the weight filtration, similar to the weight filtration on motives. So, you know, you mm -hmm. want to be exact, so on and so forth. And then you also, for some, not for all of them, for some of them, you also need the associated gradient of M to be a semi-simple object. Uh -huh. That's all you need. So it actually works in the generality of, you know, Tanakin categories over characteristic zero equipped to the weight filtration. So, so for example, uh, does it apply to like the category of Andre motives in characteristic zero? Of course, yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Andre motives isn't that pure though? Uh, it is pure. I think. Well, okay. So if it's semi simple, then all of these questions are irrelevant, right? Because they, there will be no unipotent radical. The groups will be reductive. Oh, yeah. But I think. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. Then it doesn't make sense. But then. Maybe would... it also has a mixed. If it has a mixed category of motives, then yes, it, it absolutely applies to that as well. Okay, but then I was wondering, like, do you expect this to be true for, uh, like, in characteristic P? Well, okay, so uh, uh, I, I, would, I don't want to tell you something that, you know, uh, that, you know, I'm, I'm, I won't answer because I, I don't feel comfortable answering it. I, I, wanna, I don't want to say something that, you know, I, I don't have, I'm not enough knowledgeable enough about that to be able to answer. The, the, so the, the Tanakin categories we're working with, they are in characteristic zero, and that is actually, See, because we are using these results about the, you know, the unipotent radical and the algebra, you know, the, the, the equivalence of categories that you have, so on and so forth. Yeah. And so I, I, I don't think you have that in characteristic P, do you? Uh, so, uh, so Andre P. has some category in characteristic P, but that's also pure. I see. So the, to, be, to pure the whole doesn't apply, but the, the motives in characteristic P, um, I, I actually don't know much about them, so I will not... Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, but but you you really need. I will mislead you if I try to answer the question more than being helpful actually. <laughs> but but anyway, like you really need categories that are independent of the reference cohomology you're you're using, right? Well, like I mean, this is a, so. See, okay, so uh, the, as I said, so the, the the theorem works in the generality of neutral Tanakin categories, characteristic zero uh, with a weight filtration. So you do need existence of fiber functors. Okay, but because we are actually our proofs do use the fiber functor. But, but do you compare the fiber, like you need some kind of comparison? The proof doesn't actually, fiber. yeah. So see the objects you're dealing with, the statements you're dealing with, actually the fiber functor is irrelevant to that, right? All of these things are, you know, extensions in the category and the, 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 the statements don't see the fiber functor. If you think but about you the, use it the proof the uses proof. the fiber functor, so you need existence of fiber functor, and the proof actually does use the fact that these objects are independent of the fiber functor. So because okay. we have to pick our fiber functor to be a graded fiber functor to be able to do the calculation. Okay, then that's an extra difficulty in CAR P because you don't even have the independence of fiber functors. Okay, in then yeah. Yeah, not even for the nicest categories. So, okay, okay, thanks. No problem, no question. Are there any other questions uh, for Bema? Could I just uh, um, add, Yuji, um, uh, to what Payman is saying? You see, the this Lie algebra of the unipotent radical is an object in the category, so it's not doesn't depend on the fiber functor at all. All of the calculations are that it's independent of the fiber functor. But, but the does the proof use like some kind of comparison between different fiber factors? No, not really. Once you once you get it as a 
once you get it as a representation of the Monte Carlo group, that's it, you're done, aren't you, Raymond? Well, uh, so Puma, it doesn't compare fiber functors, correct, but it does use independence because we have to take our fiber functor to be a graded fiber functor to be able to do the calculation. Uh -huh. So it does use the fact that these objects, as you said, you know, the, the, the underlying U is something, you know, completely canonical, doesn't depend on it. It does use that fact, but we have to be, uh, you know, uh, careful in picking the fiber functor to do the calculation. Because I, I was just saying that I think the main like obstruction to making the proofs work in characteristic P is usually like what you have in car zero that you don't have in car P is usually the, the fact that the category itself may depend on the, the fiber functor you're choosing, like what realization you're choosing in car P. And this is true even for like category of pure motives in car P. So. So if the proof uses any kind of comparison between different fiber functors, then, then maybe it's, it, it might be difficult to generalize to CARP. Yeah, I mean, you, we can take this offline, but I think you're right. Uh, I remember now an earlier problem, even with Mumford, even with Mumford Tate groups. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah it's not defined in characteristic P, yeah, right? That's right, that's right, that's right. Yeah, yeah. All right, then do we have any <laughs> other? <laughs> it will be interesting to define yeah. property groups in positive characteristics. So, yeah, sorry, uh, I, I should hand it back to the organizer. No, no, please, please, Gary. Uh, if you have a further question or comment, please go ahead. Uh, no, I'm, I'm done, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> okay, if there are uh, uh, no more questions or comments, then please let's thank uh, Payman again. Oh, and happy birthday, Steve. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I was the only person, I, I don't want to be the only person that forgets. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we'll resume uh, tomorrow morning at, well, morning in Toronto at uh, nine o'clock Toronto time. Um, and if you uh, so choose, the link to Gather Town is there. So have a great day, everyone, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow.